Hey you guys, welcome back to Flickers of Fear, my little movie review series. So I kind of figure most of y'all watching this, y'all are all horror nerds like I am, right? No shame. Um, and as you probably know, this has probably happened to you. <laughs> Every now and then, uh, you just find yourself in the mood for some real, just pure, unadulterated 1970s Limburger cheese, man. You just want something super, super cheesy from the 1970s. So uh, being in one of those moods myself this week, as happens from time to time, I decided I was gonna, you know, toddle on over to Shudder and check out this 1970s flick. I knew it was on there because I'd seen it previously. And I'd kind of been curious to see it because this was a movie, I mean, I saw a lot of these kind of real cheesy movies from the 70s, but this one had somehow kind of passed me by back in the day, even though I had heard about it. So the movie that we're going to be talking about is the rather outlandish 1978 opus, if you want to call it that, known as The Manitou. Now, this is actually based on uh, a novel by Graham Masterton, and he's a British author. I mean, he's very, very famous in the horror community. This was actually, The Manitou was actually his debut novel. Uh, it came out two years prior to the movie coming out. Now, the movie version, uh, this was sadly the last movie that was directed by a guy named William Girdler, who actually died in a helicopter crash, like, before this movie even came out, like, after he was done working on it. So William Girdler actually made only nine movies, you know, over the course of his career, because obviously it was uh, cut short, sadly. Um, but he kind of made things in several different genres. He made a couple black exploitation movies. He made Abby, which was kind of like the quote unquote black exploitation, like Exorcist ripoff. That was from 1974. He made one called Sheba Baby, which I think had Pam Greer in it. Um, he did uh, Three on a Meat Hook, which was kind of like, a, I think it's about, um, was it about Ed Gein? I think it was like loosely based on Ed Gein. Uh, it was kind of like a pro Proto Slasher, that was from 1972. He did a couple of political thrillers. He did one called Project Kill that had Leslie Nielsen in it, of all people. And he did probably best known for doing a couple of kind of like killer animal, like eco horror type of movies. Uh, he did Grizzly from 1976 and Day of the Animals uh, from 1977, which is uh, a lot of fun if you haven't seen it. Now, The Manitou, though, doesn't really fall into any of these prior categories that I just uh, discussed. This is kind of something, I'm not really sure what genre you'd call it. It's kind of like a body horror movie, sort of, but it also has kind of like supernatural overtones that were inspired by Native American mythology, specifically like Algonquian mythology. Gonna say it's got a pretty impressive cast also. Uh, you got the lead role is played by, you know, the Hollywood legend, Tony Curtis. Also has some significant roles for some other probably, like, actors you'll probably recognize. Michael Ansara, who was actually a Lebanese actor, um, and he played Native American characters a lot, uh, as he does in this movie. But I actually recognized him from the Buck Rogers TV show, Buck Rogers in the 25th Century. And he was also Commander Kang, I think, like, on the original Star Trek series. And this movie also has uh, Susan Strasberg in it, who was kind of like a big it girl, like back in the 70s. She was in the movie The Trip with Peter Fonda. And she was also in a couple episodes of uh, Night Gallery. That's where I remembered her from. And this also has a cameo appearance by none other than the legendary Burgess Meredith. He's only like in one scene, but it's a memorable one. I'm going to say that. Now, this movie starts out relatively normally, I'm going to say. Um, it almost plays out a little bit like a kind of amusing romantic drama comedy, dramedy, if you want to call it that, of kind of the type that were popular back then, like in the 1970s. Um, you know, albeit this one has a net goiter involved, which I'll get into in a little bit. But I'm going to say that as the movie goes on, it gets pretty wacky toward the end, pretty wacky. Um, so much so that at one point I was watching this movie and I kind of like dozed off for a couple minutes because, you know, I work long hours and it's, and, you know, when you get old, it's kind of hard to stay awake for like a whole movie, especially if you got up really early. So I kind of dozed off for a few minutes, not very long. And when I woke up, I was like so confused by what was going on in the movie that I thought like maybe somebody had dosed me or something. I'm like, what the fuck is happening right now? <laughs> like, it seemed like it was kind of normal leading up to this. And then I was just like, it just went like bonkers, like toward the end. So now I wouldn't call the Manitou a good movie. 
by any stretch of the imagination, anything, any measurement that you would care to use. But it is a very, very entertaining one. And there's just plenty of kind of what the fuck moments in it for you to just wonder at and enjoy. So there's that. So at the beginning of the movie, the movie is actually set in uh, San Francisco and it was shot there as well. Um, We're following a woman named Karen (laughs) and she's not... Not like a Karen, like that name implies nowadays, but she's just a regular Karen. Now, she's actually consulting a medical professional about this kind of like disgusting growth that's on her neck. You know, see, I told you I would come back to the neck goiter thing. Now, she says that she first noticed it three days ago, and it's been kind of like expanding, growing at quite an alarming rate uh, since then. She says it doesn't hurt, but she tells the doctor something... (laughs) (laughs) that should immediately send up red flags. She's like, yeah, sometimes it moves around almost as though there's something inside it that's like settling into bed as though it's trying to become more comfortable. And you're just like, "Uh uh-oh, you know what I mean? It's that kind of situation. So the doctors tell her, oh, it's probably nothing to be concerned about, which, you know, that's easy for them to say. But they schedule a surgery to remove it, like just in case. But after she leaves... The doctors, uh, one of whom is actually like a tumor specialist who I assume they've brought in to like consult on this case. They kind of like privately discuss between each other. That's like, oh my God, we've never seen anything like this growth before. And the tumor guy specifically says, whatever it is that the x-rays, because they x-rayed it, they said the x-rays are showing something inside there that looks a little too much like a fetus for comfort. Now, why they failed to tell the actual patient any of this information is really not explained. But, you know, I mean, I guess if you're a woman with a possibly cancerous baby tumor, like, growing on your body somewhere, there's just really no need for you to worry your pretty little, pretty little woman head about it. I mean, you know, I'm sure the dudes have it under control. Karen, though, is no dummy, and she is pretty sure that the doctors are not really giving her the full picture about her condition. Now, for whatever reason, um, she decides that the best course of action now is to call Tony Curtis, or at least the character that he's playing in this movie, whose name is Harry Erskine, I think is his last name. You find out later that Karen actually used to work with Harry and that they had, you're guessing, like a prior romantic relationship, but haven't seen each other in a really long time. I don't know how long it is, but long enough it would be like, wow, you're looking good. I haven't seen you in ages, blah, blah, blah. So it's that kind of situation. Now, up to this point, we've also kind of been getting glimpses into Harry's life as well. Now, he actually makes his living as this sort of like cheese dick fortune teller, um, reading tarot cards for like all of these doddering rich old ladies that like come to visit him, like wanting affirmation and things like that, like, you know, and advice on their love lives and indigestion and various other things um i actually these were kind of like funny scenes so like like i said at the beginning it almost seems like a comedy drama not a comedy comedy but it does have like a lot of kind of work to do like kind of quirky little uh tone like that especially like with all of the clients that are coming to see him and i actually did like laugh out loud at one point when harry like he says goodbye to his latest client and you're kind of led they kind of imply that it's like a prostitute that lives across the hall because they kind of like have a little exchange and I'm just like, oh, okay. So there's that. Um, But he sees off the old lady and closes the door and then he peels his fake mustache off and like sticks it on the wall. (laughs) And then, like, he goes and puts his normal clothes on and, like, has a beer and everything like that. I just, I don't know why I thought that was so funny to me that, like, he just took off his thing and was like, dude, like, you were sticking gum on the bedpost or some shit like that. I don't know. That just really made me laugh. So when Karen calls him up and wants to meet, though, I mean, Harry is immediately like, oh, yes, ma'am, whatever. Like, so he's immediately on board with this. So that implies to me that he's still, like, carrying a torch for her. You know what I mean? Now, it's not entirely clear whether... Karen called him because she wanted him to tell her future, like in regards to the net growth and the surgery that she's going to have the next day. I mean, because she does make it obvious later that she doesn't really believe any of this fortune telling shit or whether she's just missing some of that sweet soothsaying Harry dick. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? It could be both things. It could be both things. I don't know. So anyway, they meet up and Harry he just, he assures her everything is going to be a-okay with the surgery, even though his tarot cards indicate otherwise. So I will note that this is another dude who is also keeping crucial information from Karen, you know, in, in other words. 
So the pair of them then reconnect, uh, by which I mean it's implied that they fuck. They don't really show it, but you know what I mean? They both are at the house and they both have robes on, so I'm assuming something happened there. Um, but while Karen is kind of like sleeping in the in front of the fireplace, like on the bearskin rug, I don't think it was a bearskin rug, but you know what, that was what I was imagining anyway. So she says this weird phrase in her sleep that sounds something like, and I had the um, closed captioning on, so it actually spelled it out. It sounds like Panna Witchy Salatu, which every time somebody said that in the movie, which was a lot of times, um, I just kind of went, Ew! like, I just kind of cringed. I don't know. It just sounds very, very cringy to me. So the next morning, Harry is actually dropping her off for the surgery, and he asks her about it. He's like, what the fuck does that mean? Like, you said it in your sleep. And she's like, I don't know. I never heard that before in my life, and I don't remember saying that. So, not too surprisingly, though, uh, the surgery does not go so well. Um, matter of fact, it actually doesn't go at all because as soon as the doctor, like, puts the scalpel on the growth, like, gonna cut it off, Karen's supposedly anesthetized eyes, like, kind of pop open, her heart rate goes crazy, and she's kind of like, and then the doctor actually slices his own wrist, like, with the scalpel, like he's under some kind of overpowering mind control or something like that. So after that, Karen gets put back in her hospital room and I'm presuming they sedate her while the doctor's trying to figure out like what the hell happened with that. Meanwhile, one of Harry's clients, who's this kind of flaky old woman named Mrs. Hertz, Hertz, hers, something like that. She has some kind of like seizure during her session with him. And then she says the same words that Karen said. And then she legit like levitates out of the room, like levitates down the hallway of the apartment building. And then like throws herself down the stairs, like where she presumably dies. They never really say that, but you're presuming that, that she's dead. So Harry, a uh, little freaked out by this, as you probably would be, he actually goes to talk to the tumor doctor. And after he hears about what happened, you know, with Karen's surgery, he starts to become convinced that whatever it is that is in her neck growth is causing maybe some kind of like psychic force to be unleashed, like through her body, I guess, essentially. Now, naturally, the doc does not buy into this theory, um, though he does admit this whole situation is pretty fucking weird and he's not really sure what's going on. So Harry decides that he's going to kind of use his connections on the, you know, spiritual side of things because, you know, he's kind of like a fortune teller to kind of try and help Karen before this goiter gets so big that it essentially like consumes her or kills her or whatever. So the first thing he does, he goes and talks to this couple that he knows who own this kind of like new agey type store. And they set up this seance and they're gonna ask the spirits about this entity or whatever it is that's supposedly possessing Karen. So um, it, it actually, this is the movie's best effect probably because when they have the seance, this like freaky looking dude like emerges from the middle of the seance table. Like it almost looks like he's coming out of like a pool of oil. Like it's all black and it's like they, they show his face like an extreme close up and it's this kind of like oily black kind of thing going on. And it's like really cool. Now he doesn't say anything that anybody can understand. He's like speaking in some unknown language, but because the, the medium at the seance says that he reminds her of one of those, you know, cigar store Indian type things. Like they used to have, you know, like old Chief Woodenhead in the Stephen King story, like that kind of thing. So she says, well, since he kind of looks like that, um, they kind of deduce that maybe whatever this thing is, this entity is, is like some kind of being from Native American folklore. So the group of them then actually go to visit Burgess Meredith, who is playing this kind of Colonel Sanders looking anthropologist who's named Dr. Hughes. And he wrote a book about Native American folklore, and he mentioned a thing called title drop the manitou now this is essentially kind of like a life force from what i can understand from like that certain powerful medicine medicine men could use to essentially be reborn in different bodies like which would cause them to live forever i mean at least according to the stories right um dr hughes also tells them that that phrase pana witchy salatu <laughs> which like i said is making me cringe every time i say it um actually means my death foretells my return which doesn't make a lot of sense if you really think about it, but whatever. Um, so yeah, so he doesn't actually believe any of these legends are true. Obviously, he's an anthropologist. He's not, you know, into the new agey kind of shit. Um, but he does suggest that, you know, the Scooby gang go and talk to an actual medicine man and like, you know, leave me the fuck alone pretty much. 
So at this stage in the story, Harry actually goes to visit this movie's magical Native American, which, you know, a lot of movies back then had one. Uh, and this guy's name is John Singing Rock. And he's uh, initially pretty cranky, um, but he eventually, grudgingly, agrees to help Harry's pasty white ass in exchange for some tobacco and a $100,000 donation to, like, a specific Native American charity. Where Harry got his hands on a hundred grand is not ever explained. Um, he doesn't even bat an eye when the guy says this. So I'm assuming he's got like some good investments or he's kin to the Rockefellers or something because he's like, Hey, hundred thousand dollars. Hey, no problem. You know what I mean? I was just like, Holy fucking shit. And this was like the 1970s. <laughs> so that was like a lot more money back then. So John singing rock is actually able to communicate with this entity that's growing inside Karen's net goiter, <laughs> which is, a sentence I never thought that I would say out loud, but here we are. And uh, so the entity actually reveals that he's a shaman named Misquamachus. Now, Misquamachus, fun fact, is actually a character from the August Derleth novel from 1945, which is called The Lurker at the Threshold, which was based on unfinished writings by, you guessed it, H.P. Lovecraft. So if you see the book nowadays, it usually says H.P. Lovecraft with August Derleth. You know what I mean? Poor August Derleth, but yeah. But I mean, H.P. Lovecraft like left a bunch of stuff like after he died and August Derleth like finished it out. And the, so The Lurker at the Threshold, he's a character in that, Misquamachus. So Misquamachus is actually like pretty annoyed by this whole, uh, you know, white man wiping out the indigenous peoples deal. And he's decided that he's going to possess Karen's body so he can return and, like, take revenge. Why he chose Karen in particular is never clarified. Um, and it's also not clear why Misquamachus waited so long, like, to come back and, like, kick some Caucasian ass. Um, I don't really know. Maybe I'm sure he was busy doing something else, and I don't know what that was. But you know what I mean? He's, he eventually just decided he's just kind of a lazy bum. And he's just like, you know what? I'm still mad. I'm going to I'm going to possess some random woman and come back and, and do some shit. So it's at this juncture where the movie just cranks up the level of bat shittery like to 11 and just goes pretty much like balls to the wall, banana pants, like for the remainder of the runtime. So basically, Miss busts out of Karen's net goiter. <laughs> yes, you heard that correctly. Um, he kind of looks like this little naked brown dwarf with these crazy, like, loony eyes. And he just starts pulling all kind of, like, paranormal shenanigans. Um, he, for example, uh, telekinetically cuts up John's face with scalpels. Like, off screen, you just see, like, the outcome of that. Also freezes the hospital hallway for some reason, including freezing the hapless uh, receptionist that's out there. Uh, her frozen head actually breaks off later, so that's fun. Also, at one point, he sicks a process shot of a giant lizard uh, at our heroes. So there's that kind of stuff too. So after all of this shit happens, John uh, tells Harry, you know, Misquamachus, he's just way too powerful for me to fight. And although the demon is temporarily put out of commission by Harry, like, hefting a typewriter at him. So, uh, but, you know, in, in spite of that, yeah, he, he's for real, like, too powerful for John to fight. So Harry, at this point, gets a little bit frustrated with John's kind of defeatist attitude. So he wonders whether... The Manitous, Manatees, Manat, what is the, I don't know what the, I don't even know if that would be like, um, would have like a plural. I'm not really sure. But he's saying whether the Manitous inside all the hospital's machines might somehow kind of be harnessed to battle Misquamachus, which, what? Like, I, I don't know. And I don't think, like I said, I did doze off like for a couple of minutes, but I'm pretty sure I didn't miss anything where that was set up. Where it's like, oh, well, I guess the implication is that everything, like even um, inanimate objects, have a manitou, like have a life force. So I get that, but I don't know if that was adequately set up because it just seems like he kind of pulls it out of his butt oh didn't you say like doesn't this hospital have like super high-tech machines yeah so well couldn't the manitous from those machines like couldn't we call on them to like fight the demon or whatever and i'm just like what the fuck are you even talking about like what how did you even get that idea i don't know but anyway so they do it like they give this bizarre plan a spin right but apparently the collective life forces of, you know, the EKG machines and the ventilators and all that kind of stuff don't want to help the white people either. 
So now it looks like in something that kind of reminded me a little bit of like altered states or something like that. It kind of looks like Karen's hospital room is like floating in this void, like in the far reaches of outer space or whatever. And against this backdrop, you have like the final battle royale. So Miss Guamacus is kind of like over there going <laughs> like snickering and like throwing fireballs at everybody. And, you know, like Harry and John are like ducking them. Then the machine manitous are in there like chastising John for helping Whitey. And then there's this like kind of an old great one or something like that. It looks like a weird big light eyeball thing. So there's that. So yeah, so they're fighting and like, it looks like they're losing. But then Harry decides, he calls to Karen to fight back. Um, so Karen finally like sits up in her bed because that bitch has just been like, her lazy bum ass has just been laying there in the bed the whole time, like while this whole ordeal is going on. And I'm just like, yeah, why don't you get up and contribute? This is all because of you, you know? So yeah, so she finally like sits up and she starts like chucking magical lightning balls like back at the demon also i'm pretty sure at this point where she's doing this she's naked although she wasn't before and she isn't afterward either um and it's kind of hard to tell because of like all the darkness and the flying light beams and whatnot but i thought i saw some boobies there so i don't know if like i guess only naked ladies can fight demons in the movies universe or whatever i mean if that's the rules then okay fair enough but i'm i'm pretty sure i saw boobs i'm just saying it's, it's not like right in your face and i think like one of the movie posters too like had her kind of naked like from the side so i'm guessing yeah she was naked but like i said she wasn't before and she wasn't after so whatever it was just very random so i guess that uh karen's you know pink floyd laser light show that she had going there and maybe her like bare breastage um were just too much for miss guamacus to handle because he kind of like disappears in a big fucking explosion or whatever um i think it's mentioned that harry's love for karen was able to defeat the evil when everything else failed or whatever but i'm not really sure like the logistics of how all of that works and that wasn't really even set up either but anyway so miss guamacus he gets beaten back along with the great old one thing who was kind of backing him up everything goes back to normal again even though john singing rock says that miss guamacus isn't really dead he's just kind of like temporarily sidelined um you know so i guess i mean the demon seemed pretty hell-bent on revenge though so I'm guessing it probably won't be all that long before he decides to install himself in someone else's bodily protuberance in order to like be born again just like busting out of fucking <laughs> a fucking you know zit somewhere so uh you know have those moles and swellings checked people <laughs> you never know you got some algonquian like fucking troublemaker skulking around inside your fucking <laughs> inside your moles and whatnot uh so yeah as i mentioned like the manitou it's not a great film okay it's it's pretty silly it's completely unbelievable and kind of uh just pulls the mythology right out of its butt like whenever it's convenient but i have to say that it's pretty fucking enjoyable like for all of that it's just overtly ridiculous and it actually had some decent special effects for the time and it just has this real sense of just complete absurdity like you're watching it going what the fuck is happening now and like you can't believe like it's just going so balls to the wall and everybody's taking it so seriously that it's just like becomes over the top like really really funny now i've actually never read the book i don't think i have so i don't know how accurate an adaptation it is i would hazard a guess that the source novel probably took itself a lot more seriously and probably made a hell of a lot more sense in context but if you've read it like let me know because i'm kind of curious so i'm gonna say if you just you know one random day you kind of find yourself in the mood for some strange supernatural craziness from that shameful decade of the 1970s then uh you know give it a watch it is actually like it's kind of terrible but it's also kind of a lot of fun just because of how fucking nutty it is and you're just like you're like what the fuck were they even thinking and how did they even come up with this with this bullshit and it's just like really really funny because like i said everyone's still like taking it very very seriously but yeah so if you have shutter at least as of this recording which is may of 2023 um it's actually on shutter so if you have that like you can watch it on there and if you've seen it like let me know what you thought about it or like i said if you've read the book like let me know how similar it is or if they completely changed it or whatever because i'm kind of curious about that so that will do it for this flickers of fear hope you guys enjoyed it, please remember to like, share, and comment, and I will see you guys again on the next one. Bye!